greatest challenge we face as parents is to be the kind of parents we want to be for our children, the very best parents. It's not an easy task. It takes time, effort, caring, and understanding. As a parent, the most frustrating problems for me occur when I just can't seem to understand why my child is doing something, when I'm uncertain what maintains that problem, and when I'm not sure what to do about that problem. There are a group of these frustrating problems that occur when children have difficulty paying attention, sitting still, controlling their emotions, and thinking about what they're going to do before they do it. This group of behaviors causes the most common and complex problems of childhood. The scientific and medical community refers to this group of behaviors as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The chaos that he would cause and the problems that he would cause in the home. I remember holidays that some, he would just do something that would throw everything crazy and it, it would ruin the whole day. Um, when I don't think about it, I get in trouble a lot more and it's harder to get along. I think the hardest part was in both of the children. You, you look at yourself and say, it must be my fault. I must be a bad parent. I don't know how to cope with it. I don't know how to deal with it. And so that's the um, main thing you look at is it yourself. You must be doing something else. In the hospital, when he was first born, um, as they were bringing the babies to the rooms, you can hear the carts rattling down the hall, and you can hear the little baby sounds, and you think, oh, I wonder if it's mine. But with John, I never had to wonder because there was a high-pitched shriek coming toward me. And um, if I was tired, I, I'd sort of go, oh, he's doing it. You know, but he just, he had this, this very shrill cry that he used constantly. Whenever things weren't quite right, quite the way he wanted them, uh, he used that from the day he was born. What you're about to see are the unrehearsed comments of a family that has successfully raised two children with attention deficit, and excerpts from a presentation made to parents by psychologist Dr. Sam Goldstein. Over the last 100 years, this group of behaviors has been referred to by at least 20 or 30 different descriptive labels. The fidgeties, Postencephalitic disorder, a defect in moral control, hyperkinesis, hyperkinetic reaction of childhood, hyperactivity, attention deficit disorder with and without hyperactivity, attention deficit disorder, residual state, undifferentiated attention deficit disorder, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And in our lifetime, the labels will probably change a number of times again. There are those that argue that we should call this group of behaviors a reward system dysfunction. These children don't benefit from rewards. Others say we should call this a lack of control syndrome. Still others would call this a learning disability. You need to understand that the label is determined by a committee and a political process. The behaviors themselves, however, are very real and have consistently affected children in all cultures throughout history, children and adolescents of all ages. He couldn't enjoy a toy if it were in one piece. He would have to take it apart and then maybe break the parts apart before he really could like that toy. And he was very demanding of attention. Now it's important to understand that it's not just these behaviors themselves that are causing the problem. It is the interaction of the child and the demands placed upon the child by the world, by that child's environment. And so in different cultures or different situations, demands may be different. And that leads to the unpredictability and the inconsistency that we see in the behavior of this group of children. Each of the children 
were, were different in how they dealt, how they were with the problem. Each of their problems were entirely different. Uh, John didn't do extremely. He did all right in school, but didn't do as well as he could do. David was always doing well in school. At home, they both were different. Um, but as a parent, the hardest part for me was realizing that they could get me out of control. If you live on an island somewhere in the Pacific, and you're restless, impulsive, and inattentive, you don't gather as many coconuts. You might, ca might not catch as many fish. People don't care very much. It doesn't cause very many problems. A hundred years ago in our culture, if you went to school and had difficulty paying attention or sitting still, the teacher's solution was to hit you soundly with a ruler. <laughs> and if that didn't shape you up, it was politely suggested that you not return to school and you were sent out into the world at an early age to seek your fortune. In today's society, whether right or wrong, good or bad, the world that we've created for our children requires them to sit still, to pay attention, to control their emotions, and to finish things at a very early age. And if a child is compromised in his ability to do these things, that child's going to have a very difficult time dealing with our world. Getting up in the morning, getting ready for school is a monumental task. Getting out the door to go to school can be very, very difficult. Now, before we go any further, I want to define this group of behaviors that we're going to call attention deficit. And I'm not interested in the medical definition or the psychological definition or even the educational definition. I'm interested in the common sense definition. It's the definition that I use to help me see the world through the eyes of these children. It's the definition that I use to help me understand why this group of children seems to have so much difficulty fitting into our world. The common sense definition that I use has four components. The first component has to do with attention span. These children have greater difficulty paying attention than other children of their age and developmental level. We discuss attention as if it's one skill, paying attention. It's not. It's a group of skills, including the ability to select out what's important to pay attention to. You would think that in a classroom, the teacher's standing up in front of the room, giving a lecture, that the child would understand that that's the most important stimulus in the classroom. Unfortunately, this group of children has a very difficult time figuring that out. Selective attention, being able to select is an attentional skill. Sustained attention being able to stick to something that you start until you finish it. Divided attention, being able to listen to the teacher and take notes at the same time is an important attentional skill. So there are a group of these attentional skills. And not every child with attention deficit has problems with every one of these skills to the same degree. And so when the teacher tells you that your child is having trouble paying attention, ask what kind of attention. And in what situations is my child having problems? The second component of the common sense definition has to do with arousal level. These children are more excitable. They go to the extreme of emotion with greater frequency and greater intensity than other children of their age. I've had parents tell me it's as if the child wears his emotions on his coat sleeve. Everybody around him knows how he feels. He was very, very physical, and even though he was younger than me, it would be, it would be scary sometimes. I would sometimes run and lock myself in a room if my parents weren't home, because that was the only way to get away from him, because once he got going, you could do nothing to stop him. I mean, it was, there was nothing that you could do to calm him down or to stop him or anything, so I'd just run and hide until it would pass. And for some children, this includes a very high level of activity. And it's not the activity out on the playground that's a problem. It's when the child is asked to sit still and not move that we see a problem. An inability to inhibit or control movement is the problem. The third component is impulsivity. And Dennis the Menace gives us a wonderful definition of impulsivity when he says, by the time I think about what I'm going to do, I've already done it. <laughs> These children have a very difficult time 
stopping and thinking about what they're going to do before they do it. They are repeat offenders. Sounds like such a criminal term, but it's very accurate. They repeatedly make the same mistakes. They don't benefit as well from their experiences. I'd do things and not realize what I was doing wrong. I, I wouldn't realize, oh, this is something I shouldn't be doing. And I'd keep doing it over and over and over again, and my parents would just, after a while, they'd just freak out. They couldn't understand what I, why I kept doing this. And I mean, what, oh, Michael, a spat on the behind, he'd go crying for hours and would be just in hysterics. They would just, they'd get so frustrated with me, they, they'd be slapping me and I, it didn't do a thing to me. Most children by the third time of doing something that you don't like can remember the pain of you twisting their thumbs and they just don't do it anymore. And these children, unfortunately, can't seem to benefit. And so the 23rd time you say, now don't get into dad's tools, and the 24th time, he's in there. And depending on the level of denial that he's at, you may ask him, what did I tell you? And he tells you perfectly, you said, don't get into those tools. But right at that particular moment, the need to immediately get that gratification, that reward, overwhelms the child's ability to stop and think about what happened yesterday. To stop and think about what did mom say was gonna happen if I did this again. There is an impulsive need to strike out and to respond. So these kids have a hard time thinking about what they're gonna do before they do it. And finally, this group of children seems to have trouble with rewards. They need their rewards right away. They have a hard time waiting for rewards. Delaying gratification is the term that we use. They also don't seem to be benefited as much from rewards. Rewards just don't seem to change their behavior effectively, as much as their learning history has taught them certain things about rewards. And that has to do with an issue called negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement, everybody understands. You work to earn something you would like. Negative reinforcement, you work to get rid of something you don't want. So I stick a pin in your arm until you say, uncle. You say, uncle, and I take the pin out. Well, let's look at what happens to the typical attention-disordered child at home. Goes in to get dressed. You go in a few minutes later to check on him. He's not dressing. You say, let's get going here. You're the negative reinforcer. He starts dressing not because he really wants to finish dressing, he'd rather be playing with his G.I. Joes, but because he doesn't want you bugging him. You walk out because you've got a few other children to take care of, and what happens? He stops dressing. Because the negative reinforcer has been removed, the pin is gone. And so this child is a victim of his temperament, which makes it difficult for him to stick to things, and he's also a victim of his learning history, which is teaching him to start but never finish. Same thing happens in the classroom. He's not doing his work. The teacher comes over. Let's get going, the teacher says. He starts to work again, not because he really knows what to do or wants to do it. He just doesn't want this lady standing over him. And he starts to work. And she walks away. And he stops working. And that's the whole concept of negative reinforcement. And after a while, what happens to this group of children is they begin working to get rid of aversive consequences rather than to earn positive consequences. The child says, oh, I'd really like that wonderful reward you have for me, but that isn't what makes me go. What makes me go is when you stand over me with your hand twisting my ear. That's what gets me going. So that's the common sense definition. Difficulty with attention span, difficulty with arousal, difficulty with impulsivity, and difficulty with rewards. Think about those behaviors for a minute. Think about how important those behaviors are in our day in and day out interaction with the world. That to deal effectively with family, with friends, with teachers, and even with oneself requires those skills in our society, in our culture today. Those are very important skills. And on top of that, we compound the problem 
because by the time a child is referred for these behaviors and these problems, things are usually out of control. The most common time of referral, as children enter their first organized school setting. In the past, that was often kindergarten. Now we're seeing many more children referred in preschool. Second most frequent time is junior high school. Not surprisingly, because again, the demands of school change so dramatically from elementary to junior high school. So as a group, that's the most common time of referral. And by the time a child is referred, we're facing a set of problems that often affects the child in most, if not all, areas of his interaction with the environment. We're facing a set of problems that are often related, tied together. We're facing a set of problems that are affected by a variety of other factors. Whether or not you had a hard day at work, whether or not this child's teacher was on his back all day, a number of other variables can affect how much trouble this child may have. And finally, we're facing a set of problems that are not going to be easily understood, evaluated, nor managed through one particular test or one particular idea or one magical treatment that's going to cure this problem. I think it's also important for you to understand two other phenomena. That what we're talking about here in these behaviors could actually be an exaggeration of what is age-appropriate behavior. All children at, at different stages of development may experience problems acting impulsively or difficulty paying attention or have problems sitting still. But it is the clustering of a group of these problems together. It is the intensity with which they occur. They're much more intense for these children. And it is their persistence across the child's development that is critical in identifying this disorder in childhood. It is not an all or nothing phenomenon. For example, fire setting. Either the child is setting fires or he's not. But when it comes to paying attention, when it comes to controlling emotions, when it comes to sitting still or thinking about what you do before you do it, it's very difficult to point to a spot and say, up to this point, it's not a problem. After this point, oh, it's a terrible problem. It's very difficult to do that, and that's what makes understanding and evaluating and managing these problems in childhood so difficult. Now that I can understand why things are happening and, and can even talk to the child about why this is happening, uh, it, it takes it out of, it makes it so that it's not so much their problem it's not so much my problem, it's a problem that we both are dealing with together trying to solve. The purpose of evaluation is to not just apply a label to these behaviors or to the problems that the child is experiencing, but to collect enough information about these behaviors, about these problems, and about the situations in which they occur to allow us to do something constructive and when I try and evaluate a child with these problems and understand the problems and how they affect the child, I like to take the information I gather and put the child in a real life setting. Put the child in a classroom and help parents understand the child has difficulty paying attention, being vigilant, waiting and listening for instructions. And even when he follows the instructions, it may be a little bit harder for him to listen to the teacher and get things on the paper. And so he's compromised in that way. And even when he's getting it on the paper effectively, maybe his handwriting isn't as good as the other kids, and it takes him longer to get it out. And lo and behold, he spelled the word correctly, but the teacher is on to the third word, and he's missed the second word. So I try and put the child in a real life setting at home, at school, and with friends. Define the problem, define the behavior that causes the problem, and define the situation in which it occurs. And as I try and help parents understand the need then for taking these problems and the situations in which they occur and designing a set of treatments to deal with each of those, I like to tell parents the story of Billy. Billy is a second grader child with attention deficit. Everybody starts work. He starts, but his knee looks interesting in the window, 
and the light and the child sitting next to him. And when everyone else is finished, he's not. And the teacher says, try harder. I know you can do it. That's the American philosophy. And my response is, well, if you hit a home run your last time up at bat, that doesn't mean you're going to hit a home run every time up at bat. And maybe one out of 10 days, this child actually can finish the work, which is the worst thing he can do. Because now the teacher says, I know you can do it. You just did it the other day. So the inconsistency creates more problems for the child. And after 20 or 30 days of this, the child is receiving a very high dose of negative attention and negative reinforcement from the teacher. The other children in the class recognize that this child is causing problems for parents and for teachers. And out on the playground, this child may not resolve conflict as well. This child may not compromise as well. This child simply doesn't have the basic social skills. And within the home setting, as we discussed, the other siblings, brothers and sisters, know full well that this child causes the majority of parental problems at home. And so, when something goes wrong, this child gets blamed. And Billy's unhappy and frustrated, so he picks up a rock and he throws it impulsively at a car. Well, now we do what has been the traditional treatment for this set of behaviors and problems in childhood, which is give a pill, give a particular medication. And it may help this child sit still a little bit better. It may help him organize himself or stick to his work. But success at school is something you experience by doing. A pill doesn't bring you school success. And so Billy is not as much of a problem for the classroom teacher now that he's gotten his pill. But he's still not doing wonderful at school. And out on the playground, even with medication, it may be hard for him to resolve conflict or compromise. These are the social skills he has learned. And at home, his siblings could care less when something goes wrong. He gets blamed whether he takes his pill or not. But he's not as impulsive with this medication. And he's not as inattentive. And he can wait. So he looks around for a nice big rock. He's not as in a hurry to pick up the first rock he finds. <laughs> and he can wait. He doesn't throw it at the little Volkswagen that comes by. He waits till a bus comes by, because it increases the chances he's going to hit that vehicle. <laughs> and the moral of the story is that pills will not substitute for skills. And that when we talk about treatment interventions for this set of problems in childhood, yes, there are medical treatments and behavioral treatments and educational treatments, but not any one treatment in and of itself effectively deals with the cluster of behaviors and the cluster of problems that these children experience. What kinds of treatments do we have? Well, the most controversial is medication. We also have talked about education, making sure parents understand, making sure the child understands why he is so compromised to deal effectively with the world. Not so he can use that information as an excuse, but so that he can use that information to learn how to adjust or modify his behavior. We talk about cognitive interventions, teaching children to think differently, teaching them planning strategies, teaching them organizational strategies, things that other children learn spontaneously, that this child has a hard time learning. We then, as it is, force feed it to the child. We talk about psychotherapy for these children. And most children with attention deficit are not great candidates for psychotherapy. They don't pay attention very well. But they need to have some common sense understanding about their problems and why they're experiencing the kinds of difficulties they are. We talk about management skills, teaching parents to more effectively manage these problems in children. We talk about management skills for teachers, helping teachers more effectively manage these problems. Because of their impulsive, frequently inattentive behavior, children with attention disorder also are at greater risk socially. And one of the interventions we use sometimes is to sit down and teach those children more appropriate social skills, to teach them how to join a conversation, how to join an ongoing activity, how to deal with a group of children, how to resolve conflict, how to compromise, how to listen, how to be a better listener.
So social skills training is an intervention we use sometimes. And many children with attention deficit, although they may not have serious problems with academic achievement, also benefit from academic tutorial, especially older children with attention deficit, adolescents. They benefit from having someone to work with weekly that helps them organize and keep up with their schoolwork. So educational tutoring is another intervention that's often used in that group of interventions for children with attention deficit. Do all children with attention deficit require all of these interventions? Maybe, maybe not. It's a matter of defining the behavior, the problem, and the situation the problem occurs in, and then looking at your repertoire of interventions, medication, cognitive training, psychotherapy, social skills training, educational support, and providing those interventions based on the child's need or the adolescent's need. And for attention disordered children, providing those interventions on a long-term basis. Remember, this is a set of problems and a group of behaviors that are managed, not cured. You start looking at yourself as the cause and that you just don't know how to deal with the child. The child is therefore got to be normal if nobody can find anything really wrong. Therefore, you have to, it has to be your problem. You don't communicate well. You don't understand them well. You're not patient with them. You're not loving enough. You're not, you know, just tall enough. All of those things are the things you look at at yourself. And I don't think that's really the case. When you start to get into it, you find out that isn't the case. And I think the most important intervention is the day in and day out manner in which you go about handling your child. The kinds of things you do to deal with this child's behaviors and deal with the problems that these behaviors cause. Because if you approach your child feeling anxious and angry and frustrated, that day in and day out, that's going to have a greater negative impact on that child. It's going to create a whole new set of problems. And if you approach your child feeling like you've got some skill, feeling as if you have some support, some understanding, some idea what to do, that's going to increase the likelihood that this child will do better in the world. So parent management is the most important, but we're going to save it for last. I want to briefly talk about some of these other treatments just to acquaint you with them so that you'll understand. Let's start with medication, because it is the most controversial treatment. American society, our whole philosophy is, if you have a problem, there's probably a pill that's going to help that problem. That's the American culture. So it's not surprising that this most common set of problems in childhood has been sought out, and we've tried to find medications that possibly would help these children. And again, pills won't substitute for skills. There isn't a magical pill that's going to make this child very different. And in fact, we need to understand what kinds of things medication can be helpful with. The medications we use help children sit still. They help children pay attention. They help children be more organized. They're not going to make this child a better friend. They're not going to get him to listen to his mother if he doesn't want to. They're not going to get him to do his homework if he doesn't feel like it. They're not thought control drugs. They're not going to make this kid into something that you would like him to be that he doesn't want to be. The most popular medications used today are stimulants. Again, based on the behavioral research with children and based on the animal research that we've looked at, and the most popular stimulant that's used 90% of the time, the generic name is methylphenidate, and the trade name is Ritalin. The Ritalin for David has been superb. Uh, when David's on Ritalin, he's an entirely different person when he's not, and very positive. He's very responsive, he's very loving, he's very caring, he's, he's uh, helpful around the house, uh, he gets his homework done on time, he's organized, um, he gets along with people. There are other stimulants that are used. They include Silert, Dexedrine, Desoxin. And these other drugs are not used as often because they're harder to adjust. They may have more side effects. They're just more difficult to use. And so Ritalin is used the majority of the time. There are other medications that are sometimes used, other classes of medications, if a child has a side effect to medication. 
and they include an antidepressant known as amipramine or other drugs uh, among them, clonidine, Haldol, Melaril. These are much more uh, serious medications. They're not used very commonly for children with attention deficit. And when they are used, it's because the child has attention deficit and some other problem. And no matter what medication we use, we have to look at the risks and the benefits. And the risks should not outweigh the benefits. And if this child has trouble sleeping, if this child has trouble with his appetite, if this child develops headaches, if he possibly becomes anxious, if he develops some motor disturbance, we refer to that as a tick, then the benefits are not going to outweigh those risks. Fortunately, those things happen very infrequently. And most children, about 70 to 80 percent of children who are appropriately identified as attention deficit and other sources in terms of cause have been identified and dealt with are benefited by the medications to some extent. But again, the medication is not a treatment plan. And there is a tendency, as if all you're giving is the medication, to get into a spiral in which you keep needing more medication because the child's having other problems that are not medication related, that are non-medication related. So medication is something you can talk about with your physician. It's a treatment that's used. But I like to save it. I like to start with behavioral and cognitive treatments. I like to start by increasing understanding and by increasing parent competence, parent skills, and teacher skills. Our family life is better because of the counseling the two boys have had than it was before. We all get along better. We understand each other. I knew there was something I was doing that was wrong. And I couldn't understand why the things that I had done had worked with his sister, but they didn't work with him. And I would try to chalk it up to the idea, well, girls are girls and boys are boys, and I don't know enough about boys, and that's my problem as a mother. I haven't been exposed to little boys' behavior enough. But um, after having our third child, who was a boy, <laughs> then things really started to fall into place, and I realized all little boys weren't doing the kinds of things that John was doing. Let me tell you a little bit about cognitive skills. We teach children to stop and think and plan. We teach them to reflect. And there are a whole a host of programs that are used to teach children to do these kinds of things. And children are usually taught in small groups. They're taught strategies such as what's my plan, what's my problem, what can I do about it. These strategies are used in the classroom. We teach children to monitor themselves to self-instruct, as it were. We teach children that every time a beep goes off, they have to stop and make sure they're working as an effort to cue them to stay on task. And the reality is that the majority of children with attention deficit at school are going to be dealt with in the regular classroom setting, that most of these children do not qualify for any kind of special education service. And in some ways, that's unfortunate because we're talking about the most common problems of childhood. Uh, but this is how the world is set up right now. And what we try and do is help regular classroom teachers develop strategies that can facilitate the child's ability to stay on task and finish work and be organized. And some teachers will say, I have too many children in my class. It's difficult for me to do that. And you as a parent have to be patient. You have to find someone to support you, a school psychologist or someone in the community that will help this classroom teacher learn some strategies to more effectively manage this child in a positive way. We talked about negative reinforcement. What do you do if he's off task? What do you do if he's not getting dressed? If you go over to him, then you're negatively reinforcing him. And you're helping it yourself on the short term, but on the long term, you're not doing yourself any good. We advise teachers to not do that to make sure when you approach the child, or parents when you approach the child, he is engaged in the activity. You send him in to get dressed, and you follow him in 10 seconds later. Oh, you're still dressing. Isn't that wonderful? You make a point of positively reinforcing him. If you're going to use negative reinforcement, then you teach the child that once I come over, I'm not leaving until you finish the task. So once I come into your room to find out why you're not getting dressed, I am not going to leave until you're finished dressing. 
So the child learns that the only way to get rid of you as a negative consequence is to finish the task. So we try and help teachers understand these kinds of variables, these phenomena. Children with attention deficit are benefited from that common sense definition. And I like to talk to children to help them understand, well, what happened to you? How did your impulsivity affect you? What happens to you in the classroom when you don't finish your work? And a child will say, well, the teacher gets on my case. Well, then what happens? The other kids see I'm not doing my work very well. Well, then what happens? I have to stay in during recess. Well, then what happens? When I come out to recess, nobody wants to play with me because they think I'm a bad kid. So I try and help children understand the repercussions that these behaviors cause. He, he was not a mischievous child. He was not really what you could call a willfully naughty child. He just saw things differently. And um, his idea of fun was different than what other children's idea of fun might be. Let's see. We've talked about medication. We've talked about some of the cognitive strategies. And let's, let's spend the remainder of our time talking about parent management. What do you do? And I think if you have a child with any kind of developmental problem, it is to your benefit to participate in a parenting class. And it doesn't matter whether that's a behavioral parenting class or a cognitive parenting class or an emotionally based parenting class. I think there are some things you can learn about interacting with children that, can, that you can benefit from by participating in a parenting class. Well, I was, I was always looking for answers, and so I read everything, and I went to seminars and things. I, I went to parenting seminars. I tried um, trans, oh, what is it? I can't think of the word. ET, yeah, transactional now. I, you know, tried tried working with him in that way. Tried, oh goodness, it was terrible because none of it worked with him. <laughs> John was his own man. The problem is that most parenting classes are not designed to deal with the kinds of behaviors and the kinds of problems attention disordered children experience. And what I want to teach you today is a philosophy. It's some information that I think is very important for you to use regardless of the kind of parenting strategy you're going to use. Whether you're going to use an East Coast parenting strategy in which you're going to just tell your kids shape up or else, or you're going to use a West Coast parenting strategy where you sort of sit around and ask the child how he feels, or you're somewhere in the middle of the country, it really doesn't matter what kind of a strategy you're going to use, there are some things you have to do and you have to understand. And the first has to do with the issue of incompetence versus non-compliance. Incompetent behavior results when someone doesn't have the ability to do it differently. Non-compliant behavior results when someone makes a conscious choice to do it differently. Incompetent behavior needs to be educated, not ignored but educated. Non-compliant behavior needs to be punished. So a child who cannot read, that is incompetence, he's not doing that on purpose, who is sat in a corner and told, sit there and think about it, would not be expected to read any more competently. And most of us can laugh about that and say, boy, is that silly. That's not going to help his reading. And yet, as parents, what do we do when our child repeatedly makes the same mistake over and over and over again? We give him an increasingly more punishing intervention. We sit him in a chair because he doesn't have the ability to stop and think about what he does before he does it. And then we get upset because sitting in that chair didn't seem to have any positive impact on the problem the next time. Think about that as parents. And most parents of attention disordered children will agree that Unfortunately, the majority of what they're doing is punishment, and yet the majority of the child's problems result from incompetence. If, in fact, the child had the ability to make a better choice and didn't want to do it, that's good behavior to punish. It increases the chances that while he's sitting on the chair, he'll say to himself, boy, the next time, I'm not going to do this. But again, if the, the problem stemmed from impulsivity, Sitting on the chair is not going to help very much. 
And I think that's very critical for parents of attention disordered children to understand. The majority of their problems appear to result from incompetence. And therefore, the majority of what you do with them needs to be educationally related, not punishing. Next, it is important to be able to tell your child what you want, not what you don't want. I call that being positive. That doesn't mean telling the child what you don't want him to do. It means telling the child what you want him to do. I call that positive direction. For example, if your child had his feet on the wall and you wanted him to take them off, you might say, take your feet off the wall. It sounds like you're telling the child what you want him to do, but actually you're telling him what you don't want him to do. So he may take his feet off the wall and put them on the coffee table. Now he's done what you've said, but not really. And you say, with a little more annoyance in your voice, get him off the coffee table. And he puts them on the bookcase. Now, on the other hand, if you were to say to him, feet belong on the floor, put your feet on the floor, telling him what you want, it creates an all or nothing situation. He's either going to put his feet on the floor or he's not. And that helps you decide whether his behavior is resulting from incompetence or noncompliance. Because if he says, sure, mom, and he puts him on the floor, and you say, thanks, I like the way you did that. Because as parents, we're taught to reinforce our children when they do what we ask them to do. You can say, see, that was incompetence. When I asked him to do it, he did it just great. On the other hand, if he looks you in the eye and says, make me. That's non-compliance. That's got nothing to do with attention deficit or anything else. That just has to do with, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. That's all there is to it. And that's behavior that ought to be punished. So you try and, and set up a situation to make that distinction. Now, supposing you tell him, look, feet belong on the floor, and he does it. And 10 minutes later, you come back in the room, and he's watching television, and he's distracted, and his feet are on the wall again. Most parents become increasingly annoyed. What did I tell you? The best example is playing with a friend, and they get too loud. And after the third time coming in and telling them to quiet down, the friend gets sent home, and the child gets sent to his room, and it's a major failure. And kids are just wonderful at finding those loopholes. So you say, don't scream. Sounds like a positive direction, but see, you're telling him what not to do. And he says, I'm not screaming, I'm singing. And you say, don't run. And he says, I'm not running, I'm skipping. As opposed to saying, you need to walk in the house at a slow pace. Or you need to speak in an inside voice. Take your arm in from the car. It's not my arm that's out the window, it's my elbow. As opposed to saying, keep all of your body inside the car. If children were tax accountants, we'd all be very wealthy. They're good at finding the loopholes, and I think that's okay. If you set up the situation and they find a loophole, you learn from that, and you adjust what you're going to do the next time. So I think it's important. Uh, one story that I really like is a little boy who said the word shit. And his mother said, I never want to hear you say that word again. This was a bright young man. He went to the dictionary, and he looked up that word, and he looked it up because his friends all said that word, and he was concerned about losing face if he didn't say that word, and he found ship. He thought, what a wonderful compromise. I'll say ship. My mom will know I'm not saying that word. My friends won't know the difference. It'll be wonderful. Unfortunately, mom has auditory discrimination problems, <laughs> and he gets punished. And the problem is mom's for not telling him what he could do in that situation. Okay, so that's a very important issue. Telling the child what you want instead of what you don't want and reinforcing him when he does it. Now, again, suppose he does it and 10 minutes later you come back in and his feet are on the wall again. Most parents get annoyed. And what I'm advocating is ask yourself, is this incompetence or noncompliance? And for most attention disordered kids, it's incompetence. They just don't track what they're doing. And therefore, you have to play their control system. You have to say, feet belong on the floor, please do it. And you may have to come in six times during a play session and say, speak in an inside voice. 
and he may do it for 10 minutes at a time. That's six successes rather than one big failure. Now, we come back to the issue of incompetence. Just because we label the behavior as incompetence doesn't mean we don't do anything about it. We may then say to the child, gosh, it would be wonderful if I didn't have to come in here every 10 minutes. So you know what? I'm going to set a timer. And every five minutes when it goes off, if you guys are speaking in an inside voice, I'm going to put a check on a box or put a nickel in a jar or whatever. And when we're done, if you have enough, I'll take you and your friend out to a, for an ice cream. So you're teaching some self-monitoring and you're working at a level that the child seems successful. He can keep his voice lower for five minutes at a time, and every five minutes he gets that reminder. And I think that those are very critical. And I think parents have to be a little creative. I think you have to think that way. If you, if you see a behavior that is incompetent, you need to think about what can I do to change this behavior, to educate the child, as opposed to what can I do to punish the child. Supposing he is non-compliant, and we can talk about some techniques. Supposing he looks you in the eye and says no. Now you know this is non-compliance, and this is behavior that should be punished. And it really doesn't matter what your philosophy of punishing is. I'll, I'll pick an example. I'll pick time out. We can talk about time out. And I think time out for children with attention deficit should be very short. They don't sit for long periods. We don't want to create more problems. And in fact, the secret to dealing with non-compliant behavior is not the punishment, but bringing the child back to the situation and forcing them to comply. So you say, feet belong on the floor. Please put your feet on the floor. And he says, make me. And you say, you need to go to timeout. I asked you to put your feet on the floor. You couldn't do it. And timeout can be a chair in the same room. It doesn't have to be in another room. It doesn't have to be in a closet. Uh, perhaps we want it to face the corner rather than the TV. Perhaps we want the timeout period to be only a minute, so short that by the time he decides, I'm tired of sitting in this chair, the time is up. And we'll come back to the issue of what if he says he won't go to timeout either. A lot of parents will say, ah, oh, he just won't go. Yeah, this is a great idea, but he's not going to do what I tell him. And all these books I read, they're wonderful, but the kid never does what the book says he's supposed to do, which is characteristic for attention disordered kids. But let's suppose he's compliant, he goes and sits in the chair. When the, when the minute is up, he comes back to the situation. You don't give him a lecture. You just remind him, I asked you to go to timeout because you couldn't keep your feet on the floor. Please keep your feet on the floor. And you look at his feet. They're on the floor. You say, thank you. And that's the end. And if he comes out and says no and puts him back up on the wall, again, that's noncompliance. Goes back to timeout. And maybe you add a minute. Keep it pretty short so that we don't turn into a whole day affair. And again, with attention disordered kids, if you require them to sit still and not fidget, they're going to be in timeout for the rest of their lives. It's not going to be a very effective intervention. And supposing he, he complies, and an hour later, he's again noncompliant. You go back to the same situation. You try the timeout again. What we're doing is helping you, one, make that decision between incompetence and noncompliance, and two, giving you something to do about it in a constructive fashion, whether it's punishment or whether it's some educational procedure. Now, what about the child who you say go to time out and he says the same thing? He says, no way, not going to do it. And I think the way we make change in people is to create some confusion, to create some uncertainty. If you're sure that the sky is blue, there's very little chance that I'm going to change your mind. However, if you look out the window and it sort of looks red, there's an increasing chance you're going to listen to me if I say, no, it's no longer blue, it's red. And the way we create change is by creating a little bit of confusion. And this child has a certain script. He knows that when he says, no, I'm not going to go to timeout, you might drag him, you might smack him, you might scream and yell, you might do a whole lot of different things. It just changes the subject. He's great at changing the subject, see? And in that situation, I always tell parents to use ignoring. Now, a lot of parents ignore. They ignore the good. They ignore the bad. They ignore everything. Ignoring is an active process. You ignore what you don't like. You pay attention to what you like. So he says, I'm not going to go to timeout. You turn around and walk away. Or he lays down and cries. That's a better one. He throws a tantrum. We'll come to a back to adolescence in a minute, because they don't do that. But he lays down and he cries. You walk out. Now he looks around and he says, isn't this wonderful? I don't have to go to timeout. This worked so great. 
And then he stops crying and you come back in another minute and say, I like the way you're in control of your behavior now. Now you need to go to timeout. The child does not get out of the activity, the punishment, based on trying to change the subject, trying to create another problem for you. You bring him back to that situation. And he may cry again and you walk out again and some parents will say, oh, he'll test me forever. He'll do that forever. And most kids actually, my experience has been, don't do that. And some, by the third time the parent comes back, the child's instructed, if I have to come back again and you don't go to timeout, you're not going to play Nintendo. And Nintendo's a wonderful reinforcer because there's something subliminal about Nintendo and every child in the world wants to play Nintendo. So take the Nintendo away and you see miraculous results. Kids go from D to A students. They smile, they listen, they sit still. It's just a wonderful intervention. Okay, so ignoring is something that, that can be an effective intervention. But remember, you have to ignore and then pay attention when the child's appropriate. There may be times when his feet are on the wall and you really don't want to tell him to put his feet on the floor. You choose to ignore. That means you wait until he puts his feet on the floor and then you say, gosh, I really like the way your feet are on the floor right now. That's wonderful. And he thinks, boy, if she would have looked a minute ago, I would have been in a lot of trouble. That's the whole idea of differential attention paying attention to the child, and, and differential attention is another term for ignoring. Paying attention to the child when he's appropriate, ignoring him when he's inappropriate. Let me tell you about one other intervention that I like, as long as we're talking about interventions, and that's something called positive practice. Positive practice at times is used as a punishment. We have the child repeatedly do a behavior over and over again. I like to use positive practice as an intervention for incompetence. Supposing he comes through the door and it slams, and you, in your best positive way, say, doors need to be closed quietly. Well, he's not going through another door, and a typical parent intervention is to make the child go back and do it again. That's called positive practice. But in this case, he has to do it 10 times. Walk up to the door, open it, close it quietly, come back, turn around, walk up to the door, open it, go through it, close it quietly. And you have a smile on your face. A lot of kids get a kick out of this stuff. It's not punishment, because if we don't kick a soccer ball well, we practice. If we don't read well, we practice. If we don't close doors well, we practice. And there is some scientific basis that what we do repeatedly, we eventually do automatically, such as locking our doors when we leave our homes. We do it automatically without thinking about it, because we've done it so many times. And if tomorrow the door slams again, the child is told, well, we didn't practice enough. So now we'll do it 20 times. Positive practice is a wonderful intervention for incompetence. It's great for toilet flushing. Kids forget to flush the toilet. He has to come in, pull his pants down, sit on the toilet, get up, pull his pants up, flush the toilet, wash his hands, walk out, come back in again, pull his pants down, sit on the toilet, get up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You watch how quickly he will remember to flush that toilet. And it's not a punishing intervention. You have a smile on your face as you say this. I'm not angry. But there are certain things you're going to have to learn to do successfully if you're going to succeed in the world. And one of them is flushing toilets. And so we're going to practice. So positive practice is a good intervention. Parents talk about problems with routines as well. One of the biggest problems is morning routine. David has uh, everything gets stretched out. What takes 10 minutes for a normal person takes an hour for David. Uh, David takes 20 or 30 minute showers when he's late for school. Um, just to get him out of bed and moving is a long, tedious process and he has to be prodded every step of the way to get it done. And I like to try behavioral interventions before we adjust medications. I mean, we've had some children that simply have so much trouble in the morning that the physician ends up having them wake early to take their medication so that the morning routine goes better. But that's a last step intervention. I like to start by helping parents organize the mornings better, get a consistent routine, and be a little creative. Teach the child to monitor himself. I will have children create tapes. They sit down with their parent and they decide, what do I have to do in the morning? How much time do I have to do it? And they create a tape in which they're talking to themselves. And mom comes in in the morning and turns the tape on, and the tape, which is the child, says, good morning, it's time to get up out of bed and go brush my teeth, and here's a song by Madonna. And the song plays, the child's his own disc jockey, and then it comes back on and says, I should be done brushing my teeth, I need to be in my room now. 
And again, for incompetent children, that kind of a monitoring strategy is welcomed with open arms. They change. They function better. They may not be able to function when you take it away. Don't expect that because you do it for two weeks, you can stop doing it, and they're going to be wonderful forever. You may have to do it forever. But you modify the environment, and they do a whole lot better. Now, what about the non-compliant child who just doesn't want to get ready in the morning? Well, no amount of songs by Madonna is going to get him going. And, and right away, you realize, hey, I'm trying all of these constructive things. I'm dealing with the problem as if it's incompetence, and we're not getting anywhere. Must be some non-compliance going on in there. Maybe I need to think about some kind of punishment if he's not going to be ready on time in the morning. And one of the things I like is making kids wake up earlier. If you're not ready on time, we'll wake up a half hour earlier, go to sleep a half hour earlier, and we keep doing I had one kid ended up getting, at, getting up at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> he finally got the message, because Dad came in and made him get up out of bed at 4.30 in the morning, and finally he got the message, and boy, he was up and ready for school in a half hour. And sometimes it's that consistency. Remember how behavior develops. Behavior develops by being reinforced. And children learn to expect certain responses from you as parents. And when you decide to not give them those responses, that's called extinction. You want to change that system. They exhibit more of those behaviors trying to get you to respond, trying to get you to buy in. So every time he runs across the living room, you say, stop running, come over here, stop doing all that. And you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to ignore him. Well, he's going to run across that living room until you're blue in the face because he's looking for that response from you. If you can wait him out, eventually that behavior may go away, assuming there's some noncompliance of that behavior. If it's incompetence, if he's restless and can't stop moving around like me, uh, no amount of reinforcement or reward is going to make a whole lot of difference in that. So you have to think about what the source of the behavior is. But I try and get parents to do that, to think about it and to set up interventions that are designed to deal with incompetence, to deal with noncompliance. Now, what about adolescence? And I admire anybody that's raising an adolescent, and I admire anybody that's working with an adolescent. They're at a tough age, especially in our society, because we expect them to behave and to dress and to function like adults, but we often don't give them adult privileges. And teenagers are trying to establish some identity, some separation from us, and they're not terribly interested in modifying their behavior. They often want to be left alone. And they also, if they're attention deficit, have long histories of dealing with the world in a certain fashion long histories of being reinforced for acting in certain ways. And actually, off, or, or often, when, when, they, when people try and change, they push the limit. As that child running across the room, you say, I'm not going to respond to him. Eventually, he runs across the room and breaks something. And then you respond. And then he learns, if I just keep at it, eventually I get a response. And so adolescents have a very long learning history. And studies suggest that a high percentage of adolescents with histories of attention deficit also experience some symptoms of depression. They're frustrated. They're not succeeding academically. They're not succeeding socially. And they're not succeeding athletically, which are the three main areas that, that adolescents find some niche for themselves, find some area of reinforcement or success. Like at school, I would really want to get good grades. I mean, I had the ability. I could do the work, but when reports cards was come, when report cards would come around, I would just bomb out. I mean, I should be, I should have been in middle school and high school, <clears throat> getting three sevens to four O's easily. That's just the level that I should have been working at. Through middle school and my sophomore year in high school, I was getting uh, between a two one and a two nine. I didn't get above a 3-0, and it just frustrated me. And then when my parents would get upset, that would just make me all the more frustrated. I'd just be, ah, pulling on my hair, trying to figure out why I couldn't do it. With adolescents, I want counsel parents to not be so quick to use medication, to use medication as a reinforcer rather than a punisher. 
Giving a teenager who says, I don't want to go to school, I don't want to do my work, this pill just gives him something else to say that he doesn't want to do. And so with teenagers, I may say, there is this medication that might help, but you can't have it until you do what I want you to do, until you show some effort. And teenagers with a history of attention deficit really do benefit from some counseling to try and understand themselves and their world. And again, that issue of changing the reinforcement value of the stimulus is very important. Making something that is seen as aversive into something that's positive. So we can, as parents, change the reinforcement value of something. We can, as parents, take a long car ride, which might be seen as aversive by our child, and turn it into something fun or enjoyable that they want to do based on what we choose to do with that car ride and how we choose to deal with that situation. And that's another very important variable. So parenting a child with attention disorder requires you to make the distinction between incompetence and noncompliance, requires you to think creatively, requires you to be positive and tell a child what you want, not what you don't want, requires you to learn and sometimes come up with on your own interventions designed to increase competence to educate, requires you to modify the kinds of punishments you do, requires you to think about your role as a parent and what you're doing. <coughs> now, let's take some questions. My question has to do with other family members in the family. Their lack of knowledge with ADD, and so they, they say that you know, your, your son or your daughter has ADD, and they say that's just an excuse. That's just an excuse. So you have no support from the rest of the, the older family members, and so you, they immediately say, you know, you're not being consistent, and so right away you strike at yourself because I'm doing something wrong, and this is why my child is the way he is, and that I've been accused of saying well, that I, I label it ADD when that's just an excuse. I think really that uh, ignorance is a great motivator of people's behavior. And the fact that they, or, or some people who do not understand and really have no system for understanding or a, have never been provided with the opportunity to understand why these children have this problem, uh, will tend to blame parents. There was a time when we would say autistic children are caused by cold, unaccepting parents, and we now know that's, that's kind of foolish. And what my suggestion is that you try and educate, that you get text materials, that you sit down and talk to them, and that you insulate yourself because that's going to happen. Everybody's got an opinion, and more often than not, the blame will be placed on you because those people don't have to deal with your child every day, day in and day out. And it's not uncommon for moms to have a lot of trouble because they deal with kids on a routine basis. Dad comes home, and males are much more aggressive in our society, and dad sort of twists the kid's arm, and dad says, I don't have any trouble dealing with him. Sure, when was the last time dad had to get him ready for bed? Right. And then you go see the pediatrician, who may be a male, and who may see this child for five minutes in an examination room. And most attention disordered kids, if they're interested, can actually sit still and do just fine for five or ten minutes. And so the pediatrician says, must be something wrong with you, mom. Look at how well he sits still. That's not a satisfactory answer. And if we collect multiple kinds of data from multiple sources, we then gather enough information to substantiate your concerns that, in fact, this child is much more difficult to fit routines, to pay attention, to control his body, to sit still, to control his emotions, etc. People who don't believe that ADD is real have not encountered it, and I don't believe that they've ever lived with someone who has it, and I don't think they have any concept of what it really is. Just having two very different brothers who both had it, it's a very, very real thing. And the people who say that just don't understand. Uh, should we expect our ADD son to handle responsibilities uh, that, we re that we expect our other children to properly handle? Or are we just putting ourselves into a frustrating situation thinking that we can expect that? That's a very good question. I think we walk a very fine line. I think we don't want to give the other children in the family the message that this child should be excused from family responsibilities because of the way he behaves. 
because what will then happen is everyone will behave that way. It's convenient. On the other hand, I think for the child to grow up and be successful in the world, he sooner or later is going to have to develop some internal sense of responsibility, some sense of I do things because I, I do them, not because someone stands over me or controls me. So I think we walk a fine line. I think you need to expect certain things, but you may modify how you do it, how you go about doing it. Uh, and uh, you, you think a little more leniency for that particular child needs to be implemented because the, it seems like every situation is so much more difficult, especially for our son. I, I think the issue is not so much leniency uh, as it is providing interventions that will increase the child's competence. So that if he has trouble getting his room clean, you break that down into smaller tasks and you work for competence at some level that the child can accomplish. So they can feel that they can accomplish, even though it's in smaller segments. That's right. These children don't experience as much success as everybody else. And by hook or by crook, we're going to get them to be as successful as everyone else. Okay. Socially, you were talking about how hard a time they have with other children. Are you better off still going ahead and putting them into, like, scouts and all the various sports and activities that you would, you know, um, children that don't have the social problems? Or is that just beating your head against a wall? I think that's a very good question. You know, the, 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 it's a dilemma for parents. Uh, if I don't send him to scouts, if I keep him home, if I put a straitjacket on him and hang him up in the closet, I can significantly reduce the number of problems I'm going to have. <laughs> on the other hand, sooner or later, these children have to learn to deal with the world. They have to learn to understand who they are and why they experience the problems they have. And so my advice to parents is to choose a scout group carefully or to provide extra supervision, or to think carefully about a particular coach on a particular team, but to not restrict the child from what would be considered normal childhood experiences. These kids, as much as everyone else, needs to do just what other children are doing. Five years ago, when my wife and I sought uh, medical help to find out whether our son should have medication to control his ADD hyperactivity, uh, we went to three different pediatricians before we found one that we felt we could work with. So we felt that we had to become experts on the, the subject so we could protect our son and give him proper help. How do you find the proper medical help and, and some assurity that you're getting the right direction? That's a good question. I, I think that, one, you need to become an expert. You need to know as much, if not more, than everyone else. And so uh, reading, uh, listening, going to lectures, talking to other parents who have children with similar problems, who have worked with other physicians or other professionals in the community is the best way to do that. There's no magical way to do that. There are some support groups for attention deficit. There are some support groups for learning disabled children. Often those organizations uh, are aware of professionals whom they work well with. But it's sometimes for parents just a matter of trial and error. One of the greatest challenges that we've found is there are a lot of good things that these children do do, and they have a terrible time recognizing the good things that they do and just dwell on everything that they don't do right. Are there some intervention type things that we can implement to help us with this? I think, again, children with attention deficit do get a much higher percentage of negative feedback about their ability to succeed in the world than other children. So when they end up feeling like they are pretty terrible, when they end up being unable to accept or recognize things they do well, if you look at their learning history, that's not surprising. They just don't have the same experiences of, uh, as other children. And I try and help parents uh, be positive. You're going to say 10 positive things to this kid every day for the rest of his life, if need be, even if it's, I like the way you combed your hair today. You're going to go out of your way to be supportive and positive, and sometimes I'll have kids make lists. What do you do well? What have you been successful at? I try and force them to take a critical look. And I think it's no different from anyone else who feels helpless or depressed or overwhelmed. They tend to focus on what they aren't doing right, what they've done wrong, how unfair the world is, rather than their successes. And sometimes, as a parent, it's very frustrating, but you just have to be patient. And I think you also have to Listen to what the child is saying. Don't try and deny his feelings and say, no, you shouldn't feel that way. It's wrong to feel. I think you need to say, gosh, it's tough that you feel that way. It must make you feel badly inside. It's hard to feel that way. 
but then I think you also have to get the child to look at situations where he feels well and to teach him how to do that, how to modify his feelings, how to control his emotions, and how to direct himself so that if he ha has a hard day, he can think about something positive and maybe feel a little bit better. They realize that I have the problem and they don't get mad at me as much. How can parents, I would like to be just as you've described, very d consistent and very pleasant, but how can parents who are generally quite tired, have been going through this since the child was born, and are very emotionally involved with the child, how can we buoy ourselves up so that we're able to be as you suggest that we be? Watch this videotape once a day. <laughs> One of the reasons we're trying to identify children with these behaviors at earlier and earlier ages is to try and avoid the negative secondary impacts, the problems that these children develop in their personality and their feelings about themselves, and the problems parents develop in, in generating and placing so much time and effort and energy and seeing very little result. And so the earlier we, we catch these children and the more supportive we can be to parents, I think that helps tremendously. Now we have the problem of a parent where the child's nine years of age and people have been complaining and finally someone says, we think it's attention deficit and decides we're going to do these interventions. Right, that's not easy. And it's not going to be easy for you as a parent because you have to deal with the child day in and day out. There isn't any shortcut for that. I think joining a parenting group so that you can talk to other parents, joining a support group so that you can share experiences, and understanding, being able to tell yourself, I'm not a bad parent. This is a difficult child. Being able to feel like you have someone you can turn to and talk to is very important. And sometimes even getting a little bit of counseling yourself is important. There isn't, there isn't one set answer to it. And, but yeah, everybody has to work at it. And you have to know what you're dealing with to solve the problem but I think it helps the child have much better self-esteem. I think them realizing that they're not a bad child, I think them realizing that it is a problem and it's something that they didn't cause. It, it's, it's not that they're bad, it's not that they have a horrible thing that they caused, it's just something that happens makes a really big difference in how they look at themselves and how they perceive themselves. I honestly can say we really hated each other. And the last few years, we've become best friends. And I think that's the neatest thing. I think it's actually made us closer than a lot of other parents who haven't had to go through this problem. It's been a kind of a bonding factor, I think. And in the end, you're better off, I think. I would also tell them to love their child no matter what, even if, the, if, even if they don't like the child's behavior, they would have to remember how much they do love that child all the time. And it's hard sometimes to separate a person from their behavior, but that's the key to really appreciating a child with ADD is if you can see them for the, the person that they really are inside. It's a challenge to be the kind of parents you want to be for your children. I know that with what you've learned today, you can be the very best parents for a child with attention deficit. But most of all, I want you to remember that children with attention deficit are more than just little bodies that have trouble paying attention, sitting still, or controlling their emotions. They're thinking, feeling, growing human beings that most of all need your care and understanding. Right, David? Right.